depends on the very much, it depends on the diagnostic of the patient. The doctor would give every patient a different treatment depending on the needs of the patient. The same, the same with churches. Uh, though the principles are the same, the methods are different from church to church depending on the specifics of that specific local church. So again, I want to emphasize, thank you pastors for sending the email to the pastors, this way they can follow. So again, I want to emphasize what we talk today is not the law, it's just some general principles and some suggestions and some specific methods that by God's grace I used, but you may want to pray about it with dedication and, and commitment to prayer, consistent, persevering prayer. You may want to pray about it and to adjust these principles to your specific community and your specific church and the needs there, and then to use the methods that apply properly there. Don't try to use the same cookie forms everywhere, the same clothing for everybody, because it just doesn't work. In a rich city, you may use this method, and in a poor city, you may use that method. So please understand that you may want to pray about it and see how God inspires you. And instead of trying to, for instance, as a pastor, go to your church and try to implement this program you may want to pray and adjust it according to God's leading for the specifics and the needs of your church. I, I hope I was clear enough. Now, saying that, I'm going to try to give you, if we have time, three different examples. Why three? Because uh, they are so different. One is in a very rich church, in a very rich very affluent, high-end, highly educated uh, church and community, very rich people. The other example is in a very poor church, very poor community, very small. And the third one is in a no church place. So these are so different, so nobody can say, well, that was easy because you had money. Now, in the other case, we had zero money. Oh, that was easy. You had people and resources. Now, in the other place, we have. And then the third one, we had no church there. We planted the church in, in situations that would have been close to impossible from a human perspective to plant a church. Now, saying that, I'm going now to address the translator. Thank you so much for what you do. May God uh inspire you to catch the intent and translate it in a way that it will be a blessing to translate as accurate as possible however i have a tendency to get excited and go fast if i go too fast raise a hand on your screen raise a hand and that would remind me to slow down and no worry you'll not offend me now let's start. Uh, in 2010, and I, before even before we start, please make sure that if somehow, I will be careful, but if somehow by mistake, if somehow by mistake, I give a name of person or a name of location that you delete it before you use this recording for others. I don't want to have any names or locations. So nobody who would listen to this, if they are from that area or if they know the people from that area, nobody will be offended or hurt. It's not our intention to hurt people, but rather to learn and do something good for God's work. Okay, uh, from now on, we start. Let's, let's um, again, bow our heads for a quick prayer and then we start. Father in heaven, we already prayed, but 
too much prayer cannot hurt. We again, as the elder prayed before, we again prayed that your spirit may touch me and all of us and the precious pastors and leaders in that area. And Father, we pray that your spirit may transform, convince, and tell us what you want us to do. May it all be, Lord, be for your glory and for the advancement of your kingdom and for many precious souls to be in your kingdom. Bring revival for your spirit more than we can ask or dream. We pray in Jesus' precious name and we thank you, Lord. Amen. Okay, so many years ago, I was in a church that when I moved there, the church, um, while they were good people, and that when I say good people, I mean it, good people. While, while they were good people, there was no growth. The church was plateaued. The church had no growth for the last 70 years or more, according to the conference, about 72 years. When I say no growth, I don't mean no baptisms. They had an average of two baptisms a year, but they also had an average of three, four funerals a year. And of three, four families moving, up, moving out and two, three families moving in, in time, the church didn't grow. In fact, it decreased. It went down from about 200, more or less, I don't know the precise number, to about 90, 100. In a bad Sabbath, 80. In a good Sabbath, 110, 120 maybe, Christmas or Easter or a nice program, but an average of 90 to 100. So no growth. Also, the church had a very low involvement. About 11 people were doing all the jobs. So we talk roughly about 10 to 15% involvement. We also talk about low attendance. When the weather was bad, very few people would come. Some people always came, but anyway, low attendance. We also talk about a lot of division and conflicts. I don't want to go into many details, but there are groups, one to liberal, one to conservative, one group didn't believe in the Holy Spirit. There were groups that were in conflict, people that were in conflict with the church or with one another. It was not the best environment, though good people loving the Lord, but nevertheless. More than that, one of the most difficult things was that the church didn't believe that evangelism was possible or necessary. They uh, were very pessimistic, very skeptical about evangelism, Bible studies, growth, or reaching the community. Uh, when I asked them, what do you do to save the lost, to reach the community? The answer was more or less, we don't believe in evangelism. I said, okay, but, but evangelism is Jesus' command. It's not a suggestion. It's not the great suggestion. It's the great commission. It's a command. It's according to the spirit of prophecy, our reason to exist. The reason for the church to exist is to save the lost. If we don't save the lost, we should close our churches and go home. What do you do to save the lost? Oh, pastor, we believe that we should save the lost, but there is nobody here to save. Well, my Bible says that the harvest is plentiful. We don't have a harvest problem. We have a worker's problem. Jesus says, pray that the Lord will send workers. We have a worker's problem. In fact, the word to send is not the word in Greek for sending, but is ekbalo, that means to throw out. And it is used for three reasons. Number one, to throw rocks when you kill somebody. 
Number two, to cast out demons, to throw out demons from somebody. And number three, to cast out workers when they don't want to go, when they are too comfortable or too scared to throw them out. And it could also be interpreted to cast out the demons that keep the workers from going out to work. So, so we don't have a harvest problem. We have a workers problem. We need to pray for the workers that God will send the workers to work. And so I talked to them and I said, uh, I don't think that you are the single ones in this city that could be saved. Elijah said the same. I am the single one left over. And God said, oh, I have 7,000 more that you don't know about. Uh, the Bible says, come out of Babylon, my people. So God's people is still many of them yet in Babylon. Jesus says, I have many other sheep. They are not yet in the sheepfold, but they will hear my voice and come. So God has still people outside, many from the church will not be in, and many from outside will come in. Remember, the ten virgins were the church, and yet five were outside. Jesus says from two in the field, one will be taken, one will be left. Not all in the church will be saved, unfortunately. Not all Israel that came out of Egypt entered Canaan, unfortunately. So I said to them, there are precious people that Jesus loves. What do we do to reach them? Pastor, you don't get it. Okay, help me to get it. We did try, Pastor. We had Pastor so-and-so, and they gave me big names in the Adventist world. Uh, Kenneth Cox, Ron Halverson, uh, big evangelistic names, big evangelists. We had this pastor. We spent $46,000. Zero baptisms. We had this name. We spent $44,000. Zero baptism. We had this pastor. We spent $48,000 and worked hard. Nobody came. Evangelism doesn't work here, pastor. Don't you know that this city is half millionaires and half Baptists? Millionaires don't need Jesus. And Baptists believe they have already been saved. So they don't come to our church. You are not here to save the community. It's impossible to reach this community. You are here to take care of us. Uh, basically, what you're saying, that I'm there to babysit the saints. La, 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 oh, go to sleep, feel good. Praise the Lord. God, may God bless you. What a wonderful. I was not there to babysit the saints. I was not there to bring peace bet between those that were fighting. I was there to do mission. Jeremiah says, when they, the enemy called him down, let's talk, he says, I have better things to do. I'm not going to spend my energy fighting because I have a mission. I need to save the lost instead of fighting the saints. I, I'm not here to, to, to bring peace between those who fight. They need to stop fighting. They need to start working. I'm here to train, empower, enable, disciple, and work and have the church work. Ellen White says that when the lay members unite their efforts with the pastors, then Jesus will come. I'm here to train the members. You cannot have victory in a war if the general fights alone. The general needs to train the army and lead the army. You cannot have a good program when the choir director sings alone. The choir director needs to train the choir and the choir needs to sing. You cannot have victory in a church when the pastor works alone. You need the church members encouraged, prayed for, trained, enabled, empowered, and to work together. Each one is called. God called each one, not only the pastors, each one in his vineyard, according to their gifts in the Bible, in the body of Christ. One is the nose, one is the mouth. Not everybody is the mouth. Not everybody should be a pastor. One is doctor. One works in agriculture. One is a nurse. One is an engineer. One does computers. 
But if each one would use the gift, one does teaching, one does music, one, one does visiting, but each one, if they use their gifts, when you put them together, the church functions properly. If one organ in the body, the heart, the lungs, whatever, doesn't work, the whole body is sick. If one member in the church doesn't function, though we may not see it, but the church is missing an essential element. None of God's people are replaceable or not needed. If everyone would use their gifts instead of burying their gifts, the church would grow tremendously and the church would be healthy, would not be a handicapped body, but a healthy body. But they said, no, pastor, you are not here to save the lost. We did try. It doesn't work here. Maybe, maybe, brothers, you didn't try in the proper way. Pastor, don't you get it? We don't believe in evangelism. If you want to do evangelism, move, go to a different church. As long as you are here, you are here to take care of us, to preach nice sermons, short sermons. Finish at 12 o'clock, because at 12 o'clock, the Holy Spirit leaves, and we leave too. So if you preach over 12 o'clock, you'll be alone. When I wanted to shake in my very first board meeting to hands of the one elder, he, good man, committed to God's work, visiting the sick, uh, taking care of the church. Nevertheless, he didn't shake my hand. And he said to me, I don't trust pastors. You don't care for us. You pastors come and go. We stay here. This is our church. You pastors come with a new program. None of the programs work. We have tried every program, just another program, no results. You pastors, as soon as you get a better call, bigger church, higher position, you don't even care to finish what you started. You move right away. You don't care for us. You care for yourselves. There was a lady in the church who came to me and said, I hate you. You don't even know me. Why would you hate me? Oh, you are a Romanian. I hate Romanians. I said, what? Well, I had 20 years ago, a, a, a team of Romanians come to fix my roof and they took the money and they left and they never fixed the roof. Romanians are thieves. I said, not all Romanians are, there are many Romanians who are hard workers. And there are many Americans that are good or evil. And there are many Germans that are good and evil. And there are many French that are good or evil. And in every community, you have good people and people that are not so good. Don't think that all Romanians are evil because a team of people deceived you. Now, I, she used any opportunity to send letters to the conference against me for no reason whatsoever. Now, if you, as a pastor, arrive in that commune, in that church, I want you to see, this is not only a story, this is real. If you were the pastor, what would you do? Would you fight them? Well, let me give you the bad news. When there is war, there are casualties. When there is war, regardless who wins, nobody wins. When there is war, the church goes down. Satan brings division. God brings unity. Satan brings war. Basically, division, regardless who wins, regardless who is right, division brings loss, pain. Jesus prayed that they will be one, just he and the Father are one. And when they are one, the world will know that they are my people. War is not an option. When there is war, the church goes down, everybody loses. To manipulate them was not an option. Those were smart people. People know if you try to manipulate. People are not foolish. And those, we had 16 physicians, doctors in the church. We had several teachers. We had several engineers. We had several general managers. We had several business people very well to do. I don't want to give you details. But when I say physicians, doctors, they are not regular doctors. One was the head of this department over the whole state. One was the head of that hospital. 
one was the head of that department, one owned a hospital, one powerful people with thousands under their command, with millions going to their hands, people with power, people with influence, people used to command and to be followed and to be listened. People that uh, before me, they moved five pastors within six months or one year and 10 months. None of those pastors reached two years. As soon as the pastor didn't agree with them, they moved. People with a lot of power. So to manipulate them was not an option. To give up and do whatever they say, okay, no mission, let's just give you a nice song so you can go to sleep and tell you oh, all is good. That's not an option for me. So what would you do? Well, I'm gonna tell you the steps that by God's grace we took. Before that, I gave you a little background about the church. Let me give you a little background about the community. The community, the city, was one of the five cities that when the economy dropped in 2008 and the unemployment was in Chicago, 14%, in Detroit, 17%. In that city, unemployment was 2.2%. That city had several factories, Lexmark, uh, uh, Coca-Cola, IBM, Amazon, a big fertilizer factory, a big Toyota plant, uh, all the horse races from the whole world twice a year in that city. It was called Kentucky Derby. When the horses came for races from the whole world, every country in the world, those horses were worth many millions, 10, 15, 20 million dollars, one horse. And people bet at the horse races, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, a lot of revenue, rich city, a lot of money there, a lot of power, many millionaires, highly educated people, uh, a lot of strong Baptist and Methodist churches, Bible, Southern Bible Belt. That's the strength of the Protestant churches in America. They have the power for elections, the power for money, strong. Uh, it was not an easy situation. So what do you do? Number one, step number one, my wife and I started to pray. Oh, it was not just regular prayer. It took sacrifice and commitment, dedicated prayer. It says in the book of Acts in chapter two, that the disciples were dedicated, committed to prayer. They prayed day and night. Ellen White says that the greatest and most urgent of all our needs is for revival. And then she says, revival happens when people pray in the same paragraph. And it's not only one paragraph. There are many paragraphs I have in my seminars for revival a set of paragraphs, all of them emphasize prayer. All of them says that revival happens when the Holy Spirit comes and the Holy Spirit comes when people are committed to prayer. And so also in my doctoral paper, I showed how throughout world history, all revivals happened only, um, only by prayer alone. Basically, before any revival happened, there was a person or a group, maybe started with one, two people, and then it grew to a group and then more and more that prayed with commitment for a long period of time. One person that prays would attract two and then 10 and then 50 and then a city and then a country. Jesus was looking for people committed to prayer and service. The Bible says, give me one person and I can save the nation. One praying person like Moses, one praying person like Abraham, like Daniel, like Joseph, like Paul, like many others in the Bible. 
we don't talk about anemic uh, ritual prayer. We talk about commitment, life and death prayer, laboring prayer like Jacob in the night. And so my wife and I prayed. Let me explain how. We prayed for the church. We prayed first month, one hour every morning with the determination to double it every month. Second month, two hours every morning. Third month, four hours every morning. My wife, I am not saying that if you pray, you should double it, but be committed at least to one hour a day to pray for your church. My wife fasted every Wednesday for the church. I cannot, I am, I believe in fasting, but I cannot fast too much. I fast every day, but never more than four hours. I fast four hours at a time. If I don't eat, I start shaking. I could go without sleep, but I cannot go without food. But I was committed to other types of fast, like fasting from any type of news or TV or whatever, and just being continually in a prayer environment in my mind praying. But instead of praying only one hour a day or two hours a day or more, I also dedicated one day a week, every Monday, that I prayed 24 hours, not only one hour. And I didn't pray at home. Every day I prayed at home for one, two, three, four hours. But Monday I went to the church and prayed at the church. Now you may say, Pastor, what do you say in three hours, in two hours of prayer? Well, according to the spirit of prophecy, prayer should be specific, not generic. Thank you. My sister says the translation goes good so far. Or I think so. According to according to the spirit of prophecy, prayer should be specific, not generic. What does it mean? Generic prayer, Lord, forgive my sins. Specific prayer, you confess the sin, you name the sin. God will not forgive generic uh, confession. Lord, oh, forgive all my sins. You need to remember and name specifically the sin. Lord, I talked against my brother. I judged my brother. Please forgive. Lord, I watched something. I said something that I should not have. You need to be specific. I want you to understand. Uh, specific. When we confess, God forgives. And specific would make you know that you did something wrong. Generic. Oh, we all sin, but this is not my fault. You need to be specific. Another example of specific. Lord, thank you for all your blessings. Mm -mm. The Bible says, do not forget any. And the Hebrew says, be, I mean, any one by one, be specific. Uh, God told Moses, write all these things on a book and repeat them to your children, every one of the miracles that I have done for you. You don't say, Lord, thank you for everything. If you really want to praise the Lord and to increase, develop your faith, you say, Lord, specifically, I was late, I was losing the plane, and I prayed, and you helped me catch the plane. Lord, I lost my passport, and you helped me find the passport. You are specific when you praise the Lord. You don't say, Lord, be with the poor. You are specific. My neighbor Mary lost her job. My neighbor Jimmy has cancer. You pray for them specifically. You don't say, may the gospel be preached. You say, Lord, in this city, and you name the city, there are, you say, Lord, my relative uh, John doesn't know you. You are specific when you do intercession. Prayers should be specific if you really mean it, if you really want an answer. Now, when you are specific, that takes time. Because let me explain. Uh, 
When you pray for a church that has 90 in attendance and about 200 in the books, some of them may be dead, some of them moved, some of them left the church. Nevertheless, 200 in the books. When you go name by name, mother, father, children, every department, every elder, every deacon, Sabbath school coordinators, Sabbath school teachers, youth leaders. Uh, when you go over each name, it takes time, brother. It takes commitment. More than that, I didn't just pray, Lord be with Mary, be with Johnny, be with. I didn't just name the names, but I labored over each name. Lord, this family, the father, his name is John. The mother name is Mary. Lord, I don't know them very well. I just moved here. But you know them. If they are sick, please help them. Heal them. Give them comfort. If they need a job, if they struggle financially, if they struggle in the family, in their relationship, if, Father, if they struggle with their children, if their children don't know you, please save them. If they have... I prayed specifically for each name, each family, each leader. When you do that, you cannot pray in one hour more than 10, 15 people because when you go specifically one by one names, departments, your hour goes pretty fast. So I didn't manage to pray more than 20, maybe 30 people a day. Something else happens. When you pray for them with so much commitment, it takes sacrifice, time, determination, perseverance. It takes sacrifice. When you do that and you continue to do it, you really start caring. Because if you invest in something, you care about that something or that somebody. When you invest in something, you don't want to lose that time for nothing. The more you pray for them, the more you start to love them and to care for them, and the more you want results. More than that, I didn't pray only for them, but I started to pray with them. I started to call them about 10, 5, 10 a day. And I would say, I am praying for you daily and I want to pray with you. Tell me what should I pray for? And I didn't talk. I listened. People, when you talk, you think, oh, I told them everything. They don't like you much. When you listen, even if you really want to tell them something, when you listen and you let them talk, they love you and they say, this is a good person. This is a good pastor. He really cares. He knows how to listen. I listened. Very important. I let them unload. You don't have to agree with them, whatever they say. But you need to care enough to listen and to pray for them. Sometimes someone would criticize the others. I will let them finish and then I will say, please, let's not talk about the others. Tell me about you. What can I pray for you, for your family, for your children, for your health? for your job. And so kindly, I turned the subject. I didn't just cut them in a rough way, but I didn't also let them go on and on criticizing the church. And so I listened and I prayed for whatever they asked. When you ask people what to pray for and you let them talk and they unload and they vent their needs, their diabetes, their cancer, their divorce, their children, when they unload, and you listen and you pray for them, you know what the message is? This pastor cares for us, for our families, for our job, for our salvation. The more I prayed with them, the more the church started to learn and the message went in the church. This pastor is different. This pastor cares. This pastor walks with God. This pastor is spiritual. He really cares for us. You cannot work with people who don't know you or don't trust you. Before you can do anything in a church, before any steps, before any programs, before any changes, you need first to win their friendship and their trust. And trust you don't win by, by asking for it, but by deserving it through your behavior. Basically, you need first to love them enough that you are willing to sacrifice for them, then you can expect them to trust you and to follow you. And so I prayed with them. Not only that I prayed with them, but after a while I asked them to also pray. 
So I pray for them. I prayed with them and I asked them to pray for them and for me and for the church. And I would call and I would pray. Then I would ask them to pray. And then I asked them to pray for the church, for God's leading, not for my plan, not for a specific program, not for my vision, but for God's leading and direction. Nobody can argue with that. I didn't tell them what to do. I just asked them to pray that God would lead that church in the direction that he wants. People cannot argue with that. And so, besides prayer, a lot of prayer, consistent, sacrificial, long-term dedication to prayer, I started to visit them. When you visit them, phone calls, visits, when you visit them, you know what to preach because you don't just preach a sermon, but you know their needs, you know their struggles, you know specifics. And so you don't pray for things that would seem like you are hammering them or criticizing or disclosing private things, but you pray for the needs of the church generally. Like people that are without jobs, you pray for comfort and faith and God's help. People that are whatever, you know what they go through and without being specific about somebody, but you know what they need, what type of food you should give them. Not only that I visited them, but I started to preach on prayer. Not one sermon. People need to hear. Psychology says seven times or more something in order for the synopsis to happen between the neurons, in order for the connection to happen, for the people to, uh, uh -huh, to understand and to be convinced and to apply it. That's the reason commercials in the TV are repeated again and again, because the more people hear, the more they understand and they are convinced. So I started to preach not one sermon, but series of sermons on prayer. Then I started to ask the church to pray and to ask the elders and the leaders and the board to pray. And they didn't, but I kept preaching. I didn't give up. Now I want you to understand something before we move to the next point. George Barna says in a survey done over many, I don't remember 500 or more churches. George Barna says that no church would change faster than four years and a half. Average time is five to six years. If you really want to see a change in your church, you don't do one prayer or one evangelistic series or one attempt to change it. You need to be consistent for five years average. That's how long it takes for a church not only to understand, but to be convinced, to support it, to implement it, and to stick with it, not go back to the previous habits. It takes an average of five years commitment. So you don't just, oh, I did it for two months, pastor, and nothing happened. If you really want to see change, it's a long-term process. And so more than that, a Jewish teacher says that you don't do all change at once because people are not ready for it. Jesus says, I have many other things to tell you, but you are not ready to receive them. You don't do all changes. He says you divide the whole change in 10 and you give them one tenth at a time. It's not one tenth of this and then one tenth of that. It is specifically from the change process the first tenth, and then the second that follows logically, and then the third. And when you put these segments, they are in order parts of the whole process. And when you give only a little change at a time, one tenth, people will accept it. And then another tenth, people would accept it. There will be no war. There will be no division. There will be no argument, no opposition a little at a time, and people get in the habit of little change, 
slow improvement, slow growth. And some people say, Pastor, but don't you want a faster change? Well, slow change is better than no change or war in the church. And so 10%, but before you know, in a few years, instead of being here, the church is here. May not be here, but it's better than here. May not be 100%, maybe only 70%. It is better than 0%. 10% at the time, until finally you finish all 100% process. They may not understand the whole picture, but if they understand this step, the 10% really well, and it's not too difficult, and it's prayed, and it's spirit-led, they will do it. And so small bites at a time. Now, I want to emphasize that church in time, not in a day, not in a month, became a prayer-saturated church. Prayer was not an event. Prayer is not an emergency. Prayer was not ritual. Prayer was a way of life. It was the breath of the soul. That church became a praying church, more than I can explain. You would go to visit that church and you will see people praying for one another on the whole way. No visitors, not one visitor ever came in that church without being prayed for. Everyone, without exception, that visited that church said, we have never seen a church praying so much. Well, let me explain. When a church prays, the environment changes. People are more flexible. People are more kind. People stop criticizing one another. People start loving one another. People start praying for one another. The people are more flexible, more malleable. People are not so ambitious and ready to reply. People are not so ready to oppose and to fight. It's a different atmosphere of peace and heaven instead of ambition and fight. And, and so prayer changed the environment. You could sense God's presence in that place. We didn't have two minutes prayer and two hours board meeting. We had 40, 30 to 40 minutes prayer. Well, maybe first two prayers in the beginning were like, la, 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 la. but the more we prayed, the more they started to understand and to love it. After two, three, four months, the board was different than before. Before, only five, six, seven people would come to board and boards were long and people didn't like them. After we had 15, 16, 17, 20 people coming to board, boards were short, 40 minutes prayer and then another one hour meetings and that's it. And God would bless and lead in that one hour to accomplish a lot more with less conflict, basically no conflict with a sense of God's presence. Everything changed because of prayer. Let me explain more than that. Prayer was not only for the church, but everything we did, Bible studies, evangelism, visits, seminars, community involvement, everything we did was immersed in prayer. And so prayer is not part of the work. Prayer is the work. And so, Number one, prayer. Nothing that ever happened in the Bible or in the world history related to revival or church growth happened without prayer. The, the Bible says it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. And the spirit of prophecy says that the spirit comes when people are dedicated to prayer. In fact, Jesus told the disciples, don't go. Stay in the city and pray and pray and pray. Pray until you receive the Holy, how long? Until you receive the Holy Spirit. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you shall receive power. Do we have power? We need power in the church. Power comes when the Holy Spirit comes. The Holy Spirit comes when people are dedicated to prayer. Acts chapter two, they were dedicated to prayer. They prayed until they received the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes, you receive power. Then go from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the whole world. They prayed. They received the Holy Spirit. They received power. Then they went. Miracles accompanied their work. Sick were healed. 
dead were resurrected. Thousands got baptized daily. The Bible says that God added daily to their numbers. In 32 years, more or less, a hand of people without money, without cars, without media, television, internet, being persecuted, they evangelized the known world because the Holy Spirit worked for them. Prayer is essential. So prayer was step number one. Step number two, preaching and seminars. I will be short about step number two. I didn't preach isolated sermons, but series on the same subject, long series, not only on prayer, six months, but then six months on spiritual growth, the need to know God, the need to be filled with God's presence, the need to be led by God. Life eternal is not what you do. What you do will never give you salvation. You don't earn salvation. Life eternal is to have a relationship with God. Not one sermon, not two, six months. Very strange. I would preach and preach and preach on the same subject. And after three, four months, they would come to me. Pastor, we have never heard that before. This is the best sermon. In my mind, pff, I've been preaching on this subject for four months. But it takes a while. People are good. People are smart. People love God. But it takes a while for them to assimilate the subject to the point that they deeply understand it, want it, and support it. They, they throw themselves with the whole heart in it. It takes a while. You don't become a doctor going one day to school. You go seven, eight years to school. You don't change your vision after one sermon. It takes a little more commitment. And so series of sermons on spiritual growth, on surrender, dependence on God, not our wisdom and our planning. And more than that, I preached series of sermons on God's love for people. If you love God, you love people to the point that they started to understand that God's call is for us to love people. And then series on sermons after they started to understand that we must love people. Series on sermon on mission, God's call to mission. We are called for a reason, not one sermon. Series of sermons until they started to believe in mission and to desire mission. And they would come to me, pastor, we want to do mission. They told me, oh, we don't believe in evangelism. Now they will say, we want to do something here. It took a while for them to change their view. A paradigm shift, a vision shift that takes time. A series of sermons on each member needs to be involvement. Each member needs to use his gifts. How to discover your gifts, how to use your gifts. Series of sermons. That was first step, prayer, that continued not for a month, but forever. Step number two, series of sermons on specific subjects. Number three, visioning. Let me explain what I mean. I didn't do visioning for the church. This is the direction we go. No, no, no. When you tell them the plan, when you tell them the direction, they may say yes, but you'll not get support, very little, and you'll not accomplish much, results minimal. I ask them to pray for the vision, because if God gives them the vision, even if it's not as big as I wish, it's only this. If they come with the vision, if they, if it's their vision that came after prayer from God, they will support it. So I asked them to pray. Now, let me explain. I'm going to give you two examples. I invited the elders four times a year to my house, every three months to my house, not at the church. We ate together in my house. We prayed together. We visioned together. Because in the house, and when you eat together, they relax. It's more like a family. They open. We ate together, we prayed together, we talked together. Well, uh, one time we were at my house praying and uh, I said, pray for God's vision. 
Okay, pastor. They already knew me. They already loved me. Some of them called the conference. Don't you move this pastor like the fight before? This is the real deal. This guy cares. He's praying for our children. He's praying for our health, our jobs. Don't you move this. We love this guy. We trust this guy. He walks with God. They loved me. They trusted me. I said, let's pray for God's vision. I said, not for my vision. I may think I'm right because I'm the pastor. But I don't know what God knows. And I don't know what you know. You know this city better than me because you have been living here all your life. Let's pray not for my vision, not for your vision, for God's vision. We don't go to God to ask his blessing for our plan. We must go to God to ask his plan and his strategy in order to have his blessing and his resources. I said, let's pray for God's vision. And then I said, when the vision is small, that's from your brain. My God is not small. When the vision is big, impossible, crazy, that's from God. Why do you say that, Pastor? Look in the Bible. When God told Moses to cross the Red Sea, that was not small. That was big, crazy, impossible. When God told Moses to go to Pharaoh to deliver Israel, that was not small. That was big, crazy, impossible. When that God told Elijah to go before Ahab, that was not small. And go against 400 prophets of Baal and 450 prophets of Ashtoreth. That was crazy, impossible. When God told Noah to build an ark, that was not small. That was crazy, big, impossible. When God told Joshua to walk around Jericho, that was not small. I could go on and on. In the Bible, when God talks, he talks big. Why pray so long for God's vision? Pastor, they tell me many times in the seminars, I've been praying for two weeks and no answer. Answer to prayer is not an event. It's a process. It takes time. Abraham had to wait 25 years. Moses had to wait 40 years. Answer to prayer takes time. Why? Because number one, God gives you such a big vision that you are not ready for it. Build an ark. Sacrifice your son. The, put the choir in front of the army in Jehoshaphat's case. Go to only with 300 to war. Gideon situation. When God talks, the vision is so crazy that it, it takes a lot of faith to obey. If you pray a little, you will not obey it. You will not even understand it. Moreover, to be willing to implement it. So you need to pray enough that God can prepare you. You need to pray enough that you distinguish God's voice. Like Abraham, when God said, sacrifice your son, he knew it was God's voice. And he obeyed. To pray enough that you are ready to obey, regardless how crazy, how difficult, how impossible, regardless if you take a risk to lose your life. You need to pray enough that God would prepare you to obey whatever it takes. You also need to pray enough because God works with people and people have freedom of choice. The angel said to Daniel, it took three weeks to give you an answer because I had to fight the kings of Medes and Persians. You need to pray enough that God would prepare the church. You need to pray enough that God would prepare the community. So it takes a long time to pray until God could give you the vision and you would be willing to obey it. So. I visioned with them, praying together, and not only two minutes prayer, and not giving them my vision, but praying that God would give them, not me, his vision. Because if they pray, and if they receive it, then they will support it. <clears throat> and so, I prayed to them. They were at my house. I said, pray for God's vision. <clears throat> And God's vision must be big. They prayed like one minute. And they came and said, we got the vision. I said, write it on paper. Okay. I looked at the papers. We need to start at 11 and finish at 12. Oh, Lord. The other paper. We need to paint the church. Third paper. We need to seal the parking. Fourth paper. We need to replace the carpet. That's not the vision. You have been replacing the carpet and painting the church for the last 70 years. God's vision has to do with saving the lost. 
Pastor, this is our vision. I said, give it to me. I took it and threw it in the fireplace. You burned our vision. Yeah, because it's yours. I didn't ask for your vision. I asked for God's vision. I said, go in the forest. Our property was quite big by God's grace in that time. Right now, not anymore. Uh, 50 acres. Go in the forest and pray one, two, three hours. And don't come back. Plead with the Lord. Lord, give me your vision. We are not willing to move from here. We are not going to move from here before you lead us. It's not worth moving alone. Lord, we are not going to give up. Kill us, but we are not going to move before you give us the... Go in the forest and pray until God talks to you. When God talks big, then it's God. Don't come back before God talks to you. If you come back, go home. Don't come here. Unless God will talk to you. They went in the forest. About one hour and a half, two hours later, they started to come back. Quiet and humble. Pastor, we prayed seriously. We pleaded to the Lord. We have been praying with you for the last six months, Pastor. And God gave us some vision, but you will not like it. I said, well, it means it's from God. Because when God tells you something, nobody likes it. Who would like to go to war without a sword? If you are Elijah, would you like to go before the king who wants to kill you? Uh, when God talks, it's not something that is, oh, let's go to restaurant and eat. Mm -mm. And so, tell me the vision that God gave you. Well, pastor, one of them said, we need to have television. What? That's expensive. It's impossible. That's what God said. The other one, we need to have a radio tower to have our own radio 24-7. What? We need to have evangelism every year. Another one. We need to have a seminar every two weeks. Who does it? Where can the money come from? We need to have canvassing every year until we fill the city with our books. We need to, and they came with more and more and more and more until I put my hands in my head. Too much. We don't have the people. Only 11 people work in this church. We don't have the money. Too much. No. Let's take one of all those plans, only one. And after we do one, then we do the second. They were not happy with me. They were very discouraged. Pastor, didn't you ask us to pray? Yes. Didn't you say that God's vision is big? Yes. Didn't you say that if it comes from God, we will have God's blessing and God's resources? Yes. Well, well, it's too big. We don't have the money. I discouraged them. They went home, not very happy. Next day, I went to the North American Division Prayer Conference to speak for the prayer coordinators. And after I spoke the whole day, in the evening, I went to my hotel room to rest. And before going to sleep, <clears throat> I opened my laptop to check my email. And I put my cell phone next to the laptop but there was a cup of water. And when I opened the laptop, I hit the water and I spilled the water over my cell phone and burnt my cell phone. I opened the cell phone. I took the battery out. I started to, to, to clean it, to dry it with the hair dryer. I put the battery in a bag with rice, nothing. I tried to really dry it. I put it in the sun, I mean, I, uh, in the light and, and on the, uh, uh, I don't know how you call it, that thing that warms the room. Anyway, nothing happened. My telephone was dead. My telephone would not even turn on. I tried to turn it on and off, nothing, dead. Well, I went to prayer before going to sleep. I could not pray. I had no peace. Lord, if there is something between you and me, please let me know and I will repent. Whatever I have done, I will repent, please. The Lord impressed me. You told them to pray for my vision. I gave them the vision and you, the pastor, opposed them? That's because you don't pray. Whoa. Because when they went in the forest to pray for two hours, I stayed in the house and helped my wife prepare the meal instead of praying. 
I was a Marta instead of being a Mary. Me and my wife should have been praying with them in the same time. But we are very concerned with the food. So I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And Lord, if you fix my mistake, though I don't deserve it, I'll go back to them and I'll confess in front of the church, apologize. Please not only forgive me, but fix my mistake. In that moment, my dead cell phone started to ring. I pick up the phone. I don't know who that lady is. There was a lady, non-Adventist. Are you Pastor Goya? Yes. The pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Yes. I am the general manager for the local cable TV over the whole city. Medium-sized city, 340,000 people. Uh, I am the general manager of the local cable TV charter. Okay. How can I help you? Well, I want to put some programs that are spiritual, that help our people spiritually and emotionally. And I looked into the churches, all churches, over 50 Baptist churches and so many Methodist churches and so many Presbyterian, Lutheran. I looked over all churches. And most of the sermons are politics or money or diluted. But when I found your sermons are so spirit filled, so profound that I could not stop listening. Usually we charge 7,000 to 12,000 an hour. It depends on the time of the day. I'm going to give you four hours for free every week. At different times of the day, different days. Four hours free. We will not charge you 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12,000 an hour. Free. If you allow me to use your sermons for the whole city. What? You give me hours free to put our sermons for the city. Yes, over 110,000 households listen at any given moment. If you go online and you check at any given moment, over 110,000 people listen to this program. That's the best evangelism and free. I said, God bless you. Go ahead and use our sermons four hours a week. And then I said, the telephone works. But when I look to the telephone, the telephone is dead, not even on. While I'm looking to my dead telephone, trying to see how in the world I got a, a call on a dead telephone, the telephone starts ringing again. A man from a different Adventist church, small church, 30 people, 40 people, 20 miles east from our church. Pastor Goya, yes, I am so-and-so. That man owns a big factory. He's very well to do and very supportive of God's work. Pastor Goya, God impressed me to start a radio tower, but my church is small. We don't have the means. I am going to donate the radio, the equipment, the tower, the machines, the technology, the room, the house, the utilities. I'm gonna put it all in writing. I will pay for the utilities. I will pay for the room. I will pay for everything. If you and your church would put the program 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We did in two languages. Then my telephone is still dead. The conference called me, Pastor Goya. We want the students from the academy to learn to do canvassing. But your church is the best church. You are praying. You are visioning. We want the students to learn from you. So would you agree if we send the students from the academy every year in your city to do canvassing with our books, our money, our students, just in your city, in your area? Praise the Lord, absolutely, bring it on. I could go on and on and on. In half an hour, I received so many phone calls on a dead cell phone that after I finished talking, was still a dead telephone that next day I had to go to Sprint and replace it. And I said, do you know, maybe the telephone works without the screen turning on? And they said, no, the telephone doesn't work. Doesn't start, doesn't turn on, doesn't have a dial tone. The telephone is ruined. You need a new one. On a dead telephone I that I had to replace, I received so many phone calls. And everything that I opposed my elders, God gave me back for free. Next Sabbath, I went to the church 
and in front of the church before the sermon, I told them the story. And I said, I have to ask for forgiveness because you prayed and I didn't. And God gave you the vision and I opposed it. But I asked for forgiveness and I asked God to fix it. And this is what God did. We have television four hours a week for free. We'll have a radio tower. We'll have this. We'll have that. We'll... The church, I thought they would hate me. The church loved me even more. You are a known as pastor. Many times when the pastors before would do a mistake, they would try to explain it. But you are humble to acknowledge that you did a mistake. Pastor, we love you even more. They, 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 for some reason, they love me even when I, when I did a mistake. But anyway, uh, that was how our visioning worked. They prayed until God gave them the direction. And then they supported it. Let me, this is unfortunately only the beginning. I need to move to the meat, to the heavy stuff. Let me <clears throat> say this. We prayed. There is a hand raised. We prayed and we received a specific vision. And I want you to know what we did that changed that church and that community. The steps that we took, the, 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 the strategy. Well, this is what happened. We prayed and I prayed for several months. After a few months of prayer, every morning so many hours, through the day with them, and visits, and visioning, and preaching. I was at camp meeting, and it was Monday. And Monday, Monday, I prayed the whole day, but I was pitching tents, physical labor, and I was tired. And Monday night was committed to pray the whole night. I started to pray around 8, 8.30, 9 p.m., but I was tired and I fell asleep during prayer. I prayed until 11, 12 o'clock on my knees by the bed until I fell asleep. And I woke up in the middle of the night around 2 a.m., still on my knees with my head on the bed. God woke me up. I didn't have a vision. I didn't hear a voice. I didn't have a dream. I just woke up with a bunch of thoughts in my mind. So many thoughts. You should do this and you should do that and you should do that. Like, wow. And my father taught me a lesson. When you get an idea, when God impresses you, write it down. When you have an ex experience, a miracle, an intervention, write it down. Because whatever you try to remember, you'll forget. But whatever you write down, you'll remember. So I wrote down all those thoughts. And after I finished, four pages of writing down step by step those thoughts that God put in my heart. I read them and I said, whoa, this is crazy. This is too much. It takes too much money, too many people, too much work. The church will not accept it. The conference may not support it. They don't have the money. This is impossible. And then, I prayed for confirmation. Lord, if this vision is from you, if these thoughts came from you, if this strategy came from you, I'm not going to do it unless you give me confirmation. I hope it's not my mind because I ate too much pizza last night. I need confirmation. And I prayed from 4 a.m. until 7 a.m., laboring, pleading for confirmation. At 7 a.m., I stopped praying because it was breakfast, and I never miss breakfast. Food is holy for me like Sabbath, you know. <clears throat> and so I stopped prayer to go to breakfast. As soon as I start, stopped prayer, my telephone started to ring. Pastor Goya, yes. This is Dr. Schmidt from Andrews. How are you doing, doctor? Good, you? Good. You remember that many months ago, you invited me to come to your church and teach them about church growth? Yes. How could I forget? You said no. Well, I'm scheduled two years in advance, Pastor. I'm, 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 I, I said, okay, tell me. Well, one conference did a mistake in their scheduling and they canceled. 
So I have one Sabbath open. Do you want me to come? Sure, please come. Dr. Schmidt, what do you have in mind? What do you want to do in my church? Well, pastor, in Andrews, we did a research study. And two doctoral students did the research over many, 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 many churches. I don't remember the number. Two, three, four hundred churches, I don't know. Many churches. And they discovered some interesting facts. And do you want to try to apply them in a church? And this would be a pilot project, first time we apply it. I said, okay, tell me the project. Step number one, step number two, he told me the project. I was like, wow. He says, what? I prayed for many months and God woke me up last night with a bunch of thoughts in my mind. And I wrote them down. And then I prayed for confirmation and you call me. And what you tell me, it's step by step what God put in my heart. You are giving me confirmation. He said, wow. I said, praise the Lord. After camp meeting, I went back to my church. And I said, folks, we have been praying. God gave me the, the, the plan. Pastor, tell us the plan. We trust you now. I said, nope. I'm not going to tell you the plan. You need to pray until God. You need to pray until God gives you. You need to pray until God gives you the plan. When God gives you the plan, then we will do it. Pastor, please. No, call the conference and move me. No, we love you. We're not going to move you. Then pray. Yeah, we will pray. We believe now in prayer. Pray. They prayed for a whole month. I asked the board and the church. The whole church prayed for a whole month. I called the board. If you want it to happen, you follow up. I called the board. Remember to pray. Let's pray together for God's vision. Let's pray that God would give you the vision. Next month, we had board meeting. Two of the board, the head elder and the lady that was the Bible studies coordinator, though they had only two Bible studies in the whole year, they said, God impressed us. And this is what we thought. Step number one, step number two, they gave the board the same plan, except in less details, in less words. I said, this is it. God gave you the vision. And then I told them the story in more detail. When not me, when them prayed and they received the vision and they told the church the vision and the whole church was praying, they supported it. So what was the strategy, the vision, the direction? When there is no vision, people perish. You can never get somewhere if you don't know where you go. You need to pray. You need to receive the vision. People need to receive the vision. They need to understand the vision. They need to know it's from God, and then they will support it with their life. And so, <clears throat> what was the vision? I want you to hear now. Step one, part one, in-home Bible studies. What does it mean? We sent invitations for in-home Bible studies. Why in-home? In the survey they did in Andrews, if you invite them to the church, only one in every 10,000 average, only one would respond. And from those people who respond, only 0.2% will get baptized, very low. I don't remember the numbers precisely. Please don't quote me on the numbers. Only one or only 0 0.5 or only 0 0.2. I don't remember, but it was extremely low. If we invite them at the church, if code a year. When we sent invitations to only one zip code, 276 people, 276 people asked for Bible studies. The church was like, wow, we never had so many Bible studies in history, moreover in one year alone. From that year, that church had an average 
of 250 Bible studies a year. Have you heard of a church to do 250 Bible studies a year? Basically, it was depending if you send in this zip code that is bigger or in this one that is smaller, we had between 200 and 280 Bible studies a year, an average of 250. First year, 276. Dr. Schmidt came and did the training, how to give a Bible study. It's not what you may think. How? Our, we will not mail it. We hand delivered. Why? First week, people will knock in the door. Americans don't like to be knocked in the door. Americans are very private. They hate when somebody knocks in the door. Only Jehovah's Witness or Mormons or telemarketers who want to sell something would knock in the door. When we knocked in the door, they opened the door just a little with a chain. What do you want? And we said simply, this is your request. You asked for a Bible study. This is the study. God bless you. Bye. We didn't teach the study. We didn't try to convince them to do the study. We delivered the study, like the mailman. Mailman doesn't convince you to read the mail. Mailman delivers the mail. We said, you asked for a Bible study? This is the Bible study. God bless you. Bye. But, 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 no, no, no. I am busy. Dr. Schmidt trained us not to talk, not to answer questions, not to stay. Deliver and leave. Don't talk. But, 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 but who are you? I'm busy. Uh, uh, what church? I'm busy. Uh, uh, come in and teach me. I'm busy. I have to deliver another 20 Bible studies. I don't have time. Bye. Why didn't you mail it? Because you receive so much mail, so much junk that you will trash it. We want to make sure that you get what you ask for. You ask for a Bible study? This is it. God bless you. Bye. Why didn't we talk? One of the church members talked. He came back very proud. Pastor, I went in and for four hours, I told them everything. Sabbath, state of the dead, resurrection, everything. Well, next week when he went there, they didn't open the door. That was the history of that city. People would talk to their Baptist or Methodist pastor. And the pastor would tell them, don't go to the Adventist church. They are cult. They are evil. And people would never answer the door. Or it was too much to digest, too much to handle, too much information at once. The rule was do not talk. Well, <clears throat> next week, second time, when we knocked in the door, guess what? All of them opened the door, not only a little, but all the way large, they opened all the door. Why? They said, now we know you don't come to uh, like Jehovah's Witness to convince us to join your church. You don't come to sell something. You come to give us what we ask. Thank you for your sacrifice for bringing the Bible study. God bless you. This is study number two. They started to trust us. Hear the words, trust. Third week, we knocked in the door. Hey, how are you doing? How are you doing? There was only already discussion. How are you doing? Good. You good. How is your family? Good. God bless you. This is study number three. And we added every week more. Hear me. We increased the relationship. We added a little at a time every week. Third week, not only that second week they opened the door and third week they talked, but we said, can we pray for you? We believe in prayer. We have a group of prayer. We are a praying church. Can we pray for you? Yes, please. What do you want us to pray for? Why? Because when you ask them what to pray for, and you listen, and they talk, when they open and unload, they tell you their problems. If you listen and pray for them, and you let them tell you their problems, when people open to you, you become friends. When people open and tell you their own problems and you listen, the message that you care, you become friends. Nobody would open to a stranger. When they open to you, they consider you a friend. Our goal was not to baptize them, though we wanted to baptize them. 
Our goal was not to teach them doctrines, though we wanted to teach them. Our goal was to build friendship, relationship, trust. Ellen White says, Christ method alone. Christ ate to them, fed them, healed them, built friendship and trust. And after that, he said, follow me. Nobody leads to Jesus a stranger, but only a friend to trust. Ils subvenaient à leurs besoins, les guérissaient. Ensuite, Jésus leur demandait de leur suivre. Donc, les gens vont nous faire confiance quand nous aurons bâti des amitiés avec eux. C'est les relations que nous voulons construire. Donc, nous demandions, je peux prier pour toi? Et les réponses fusaient, mon travail, ma famille, ma femme, mes enfants. To build friendship and to enter in the house. Le but était de construire de, des amitiés, d'avoir des amitiés et d'entrer dans les maisons. Quand nous ne sommes pas en train d'envoyer des, des emails et que nous ne leur demandons pas de venir dans nos, dans nos églises, mais que nous allons dans leur maison, alors quand nous allons dans leur maison et nous leur donnons des études bibliques, 2 à 3 demandent le baptême. Et si nous avons construit des amitiés, friendship, 78 à 78% Donc c'est un c'est un, un, une grande différence dans le pourcentage 2 ou 3 à 78 à 72 à 78%. Donc, le but, c'était d'entrer dans leur maison, d'être avec eux, de construire des amitiés. Donc, si jamais ils s'excusaient et disaient, ma maison n'est pas propre, nous leur répondons, mais ma maison aussi n'est pas propre. Au bout de trois, quatre semaines, ils, ils nous connaissaient déjà. Ils ont commencé à nous faire confiance. Donc, après trois, quatre semaines, eux-mêmes, ils nous ont commencé à nous dire, mais enseignez-nous. Et nos membres étaient, étaient, étaient bien équipés. Ils savaient comment partager le message. Et si, et si, et s'ils si posaient des questions, nous ne répondons nous ne répondons pas à leurs questions. Les membres disaient, ben, regardez la, la, le DVD que je vous donne. Je ne suis pas équipé pour pouvoir répondre à cette question, mais sur le DVD, vous aurez les réponses que vous cherchez. So, again, we didn't answer. We asked them to keep Watching the Bible studies. Alors, Now, nous, quand ils posaient des questions, nous ne répondons pas, nous disons simplement continuez à regarder les DVD. We entered, the goal was to enter the house. We didn't teach. We let them discover it. If you teach it, nous n'enseignons pas, nous les laissons découvrir par eux-mêmes. Parce que si nous enseignons, ils vont argumenter. Mais s'ils si découvrent par eux-mêmes, c'est l'Esprit Saint qui vont les convaincre. Et si c'est l'Esprit qui les convainc, ils ne vont pas argumenter avec nous. Nous ne leur donnons pas seulement des études bibliques écrites. Entre 72% of people never read a book again. However, the survey says that they spend about an average of nine hours a day on television, internet, and cell phone together. Nine hours a day average, more or less, on television, internet, and cell phone together, all three together, nine hours. People spend their time on cell phone. People spend their time on internet. People spend their time on television. Media influences the people. 
if Satan uses media to influence the people, shouldn't we use media to preach the gospel? We didn't give them only written Bible studies because many or young people don't read anymore. We gave them the written Bible study guide and a DVD for elderly or a memory stick for the young. We gave them also the video Bible study that was word by word the same with the written Bible study. We gave them the written and the video so they could watch it, they could hear it, they could see it. I want you to understand, people may argue with you when you tell them about Sabbath, but I've never seen anybody arguing with the TV. A normal person would not argue with the TV. Let the TV tell them about Sabbath, not you. People are hypnotized, are manipulated by the TV. People watch, doesn't matter that it's good or bad, they have no strength to turn it off. Let the TV tell them. And so we gave them written Bible studies and video Bible studies together. No teaching, but let them watch it. Let the Holy Spirit impress them. You know what they told us? Most of them said, we respect you and love you and appreciate you. Please tell us why. Because you are not like the others trying to force us, to manipulate us, to convince us. You respect our choice. You respect the freedom that God gave us. And because of that, we respect you. We like your church. People appreciate when you give them the freedom of choice. You don't like to be manipulated. So don't manipulate somebody else. People liked it. Moreover, why Bible studies? Many times we do evangelism a week, two weeks, a month, and we expect people to change a life in a month. It takes a lot longer. Josh Barna says that in an average, people need two years to change their lifestyle. Two years. People, private individuals, they need, and he says, everybody that he researched was exposed two or three times to the gospel before they got baptized. It's not enough to expose them to one evangelistic series. They need to hear it and again hear it and again, and then they maybe make a decision. Have you ever heard of a one month pregnancy giving birth to a child after a month? That's abortion. If you really want to have a healthy baby, you need nine months pregnancy. How do you think that in the church, after one month evangelism, we can have newborn babies that are healthy? They need a lot longer to be healthy and to stay in the church and to be strong. They need nine months, more or less. And so, <clears throat> when you don't have only evangelism, but you have six, seven, eight, nine months Bible studies that people have time to, to, to study and to pray and to think and to labor over it. And they are finally convinced those people stay in the church. After that, you finally do evangelism. You cannot have tomatoes unless you planted tomatoes and you worked the ground. You cannot have results with just one month. You need the whole year work on your ground in order to have vegetables from your garden. You need to prepare the ground. And so, we had Bible studies in home. I want you to know that for an average from every four, four Bible studies, three dropped, one continued, more or less average. We didn't send the Bible studies all at once. We didn't send the Bible studies all at once. We basically, because three out of four would drop. We sent half of the zip code and two weeks later, another half because they drop in the first three studies. And so that would give us time for some people to drop and then you'd pick more Bible studies. Otherwise, some members had two Bible studies and then they had zero. This way they got more Bible studies and they would continue to go. Instead of having too many first week, and nothing after a month, they continue to have Bible studies. Now, saying that, that was the first stage in home Bible studies. 
I want you to understand. We moved after three months to the second stage, community involvement, community involvement. In the same time, parallel, we continued with the Bible studies for about seven months. So while we continued with stage one, we started in parallel stage two. Community involvement. Why? Because the community didn't even know our church, didn't even know that there is an Adventist church. And every time they tried to do evangelism, the Protestant pastors told their members not to come to our church because our church is evil. You need to be known. You need to be needed. The community needs to respect you in order to join your church. <clears throat> so we went to the city hall, to the mayor, and said, what can we do to help our community? We are a small church, but we want to help a little. He said, well, we don't have money to clean the parks. Would you be okay to clean one or two parks? Yes. I talked to the church members. Very strange. When I called them for work B to clean the church, only six people came. When I called them to clean the park, 40 people came. Maybe because we have been praying, Maybe because they like outside activities. I don't know. And they came with plastic bags and gloves and trucks. And we went behind the mall and we cleaned the paper, the junk from the park. After a whole Sunday in the afternoon, you know what they said? Pastor, it was fun. Let's do it again. What was fun to clean the garbage? But nevertheless, they enjoyed it. Praise the Lord. Next Sunday, we clean another park. Next Sunday, another park. Then we went back to the city hall and followed up, talk to the mayor. We clean three parks. What else? Oh, no church does that. You want to keep helping? Yes. Give the city leadership a clear message. We want to keep helping. Well, there are homes in downtown, historical homes. And some of the people are old or poor and they cannot keep up with the homes and they look messy. Will you help? Sure. We went downtown for two weeks. We painted, we mowed, we cleaned some of the yards. Those people were touched. They said, our churches, our families, our friends don't come to help us. You do. You are a good church. You care. Those people started to visit our church. Then we went for about two weeks. The church members divided themselves in groups. We went to all 13 hospitals in the city with flowers and we prayed for the sick and for the nurses and for the doctors. Soon enough, the city learned about the Adventist church. Next to Sunday, we had the children together with parents go to all nursing homes and pray for the elderly and give them flowers and pray for them. Next Sunday, we invited the police force at the church. I called the chief of police over the whole city. We like to invite the police officers to come to the church. We want to give them a meal and we want to thank them for their service and pray for their protection. The chief of police told me, there are so many churches in this city. Nobody ever has prayed for us. People hate us. You are the single church ever. Not many came, but those that came Sunday, we didn't give them a sermon. We gave them a meal and we thanked them for their service and prayed for them, for their families, for their protection, for their blessing. They were so impressed. The press caught it and they put it on the newspapers. The Adventist church is praying for our police force, is visiting hospitals, is visiting nursing homes. They are cleaning the parks. They are a wonderful church. The city started to talk, to buzz. <clears throat> Monday, we divided the church and went to all 20, 21 police stations for those police officers that were on the streets and they didn't come. We gave them unhealthy cookies. We had them Sprite unhealthy soda and we had them a thank you card. And we said, we know you could not come, but we want to pray for you, for your protection. Thank you for your service. Next Sunday, we invited the firefighters to the church. We prayed for them, for their protection for their blessing, we gave them a meal and thanked them. Next Monday, we went to all 24 fire stations 
And to those that could not come, gave them cookies, a thank you card, juice. And we said, thank you for your service. And we pray for them. For three months, every Sunday, we did an activity. Next Sunday night, downtown, we fed over 170 people that were poor. We went downtown to feed the poor and the homeless for two, three Sundays. And we would give them food and pray for each one separately. The TV, local cable TV came and recorded us. People thanked us. For three months, we got heavily involvement in the community. We didn't spend money because we cleaned the parks. We did it. It was only sacrifice and work, but no money. We brought the food. We didn't pay anybody to do it. We did it. It was good for the members to be involved. They would come back. Instead of being tired, they would say, we love it, Pastor. Let's keep going. We love it, Pastor. The church became a working church who cared for the community. The city started to talk about the Adventist church as the best church. When we did evangelism and invited them, no pastor could say, don't go to that church, they are evil. Because everybody knew that this is the best church in the city. Everybody was talking about the church. First stage, in-home Bible studies. While we continued with the Bible studies, in parallel, after three months, we did the community involvement, community activities for another three months. By now, six months. Third stage, after six months, we started in the church, felt need seminars. Listen carefully. We continued in parallel with Bible studies, but then we started seminars at the church. Cooking class, health class, diabetes class, depression recovery class, non-smoking class, addiction stop class, parenting class, out of debt class, many classes. Every two weeks, every other week, we had a seminar. Not on Saturday, so they will not think that we want, ah, they want us to go to their Sabbath, to their church. Not on Saturday. Not on Sunday, so they don't think that we want them to stop from going to their church. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night. We didn't do those classes to teach them how to cook, though we wanted to teach them how to cook. We didn't do those classes so they would get rid of diabetes, though we wanted them to, to be healed. We did those classes to get them used with our church and our members because they would not come to our church. Many people would go only to their church or some people would go to no church. They didn't like church. Oh, so many politics in the church. We called them for seminars to get used to our church facility and to get used with our members. Every time they came, we had a light meal, just a little, and they talked. And they got used to the church, and they got used to our members, and they built friendships, they knew each other. After three months of seminars every other week, church was like home. They felt so comfortable in our church. Our people were like family. They felt so comfortable, friends. We did seminars to get them used to the church. Three months. By now, nine months, the baby is ready to be born. Three months, Bible study. I apologize, my telephone was on. I will turn it off right now. First three months, Bible studies. Next three months, next three months, while we continued parallel with the Bible studies, we did community involvement. Next three months, stage three, we did in-church seminars. Nine months by now. The 10th month, we did finally what we call evangelism, an evangelistic campaign. We didn't do evangelism without preparing the ground. By now, people had six, seven, eight, nine months Bible studies. People had time to understand, to read, to listen, to watch. People had time to struggle with it. And those who stayed, they already knew Sabbath, they already knew state of the dead, they already knew all the doctrines. Now we did evangelism. 
and they knew everything and they heard everything all over again. <clears throat> How did we do evangelism? The fourth stage, evangelism. I want you to hear, before evangelism, we did 40 days of prayer. 40 days that every morning, the whole church got on the telephone. They called one number and everybody could hear everybody. Not everybody stayed from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m., one hour. People have jobs. People would come for five, 10 minutes, pray and quietly go. And somebody else would come, pray and go to work. But at any given moment between 6 and 7 a.m., we had 40 or more people praying for 40 days, 40 days prayer. Then during evangelism, we had a prayer group that prayed every day for one hour and during the meetings. And after evangelism, we prayed for another 10 days, all together, 80 days, 40 days before, 30 during evangelism, and 10 after, all together, 80 days. Have you heard of a church praying 80 days for evangelism? And so during the evangelism, we had raw hosts, raw, the rows of seats of chairs in the church, a host for every row, raw hosts, raw hosts. For every row, a host, for every row, a host. Why? The host, people usually are creatures of habit. They stay in the same place every night. The host would get to know those people, to know their names, to know their family, to know their children, to pray for them, to build friendship. The host would give them the materials every night to the point that the host and the people on that row knew each other. Now, listen, we also were very well organized. We prayed for the parking. We prayed for the ushers. When we prayed 40 days, we didn't pray generic. One day we prayed for the ushers, one day for the greeters, one day for the registration table, one day for the speaker, one day for the music, one day for technology, one day for visitors, one day for uh, invitations. We were specific. Now, <clears throat> we had during evangelism small meals, small, not a lot of food, cheap pretzels and grape juice, uh, pretzels and apple juice, S simple. Why? Because when people talk, pe when people eat, people talk, when people talk, people relax, feel comfortable, and they become friends. We had small meals, so people would build friendship and feel comfortable. We had the church pray with them. We told the church, do not teach them, do not try to convince them, just pray for them. The, they said, this is the most praying church we have seen. And we gave visitors jobs, you heard me. We gave visitors, we didn't make them elders or deacons. We didn't ask them to be Sabbath school coordinators. Would you be a greeter, please? Would you help us handing the materials? Would you help us with the parking? For greeters, for instance, we had three groups of greeters, young people, middle age, 40 years old, and elderly. So if an elderly couple came to evangelism, the elderly couple would greet them. If a young person would come to evangelism, the young greeter would greet them. And we had for every one of the three groups, young, middle-aged or old, we had two, three, four greeters, half of them Adventist and half of them non-Adventist. So the Adventist would watch the non-Adventist so they don't do a mistake. Nevertheless, I want you to imagine, we asked the non-Adventist to do jobs. So imagine a non-Adventist girl saying, welcome to our church. After they said that 30 days every night, guess what? They meant it. It was their church. Welcome to our church. When people work, they have a sense that they are needed and they belong. and They want to be part of it. We gave them jobs even before they were members. People who work, they stay. So we had evangelism. Many came. Our church said, oh, nobody comes from this city. 460 people came to evangelism. My church told me, 
We have never had so many visitors in our history. Never. Whoa, we had no room. We had to put them in the gym, to put them in other rooms and to put television in the rooms. We had no room. What a good problem to have. We had many visitors. I'm gonna give you an example. Bob, he was a lawyer. We didn't have only poor visitors or middle. We had rich, poor, middle class, everybody because the whole city knew the church. One lawyer came to me, Bob, he says, pastor, I don't want to be baptized. Don't you try to convince me because I will never come back. I said, Bob, if you don't want to be baptized, I don't want you to be baptized. Why? Because if you are not convinced, you will not stay or you'll keep create problems. Unless you really are convinced and you thirst for it, I will never baptize you. So you don't try to push me? No? Great. The day before the last day of evangelism, he came to me, Pastor, is it too late for me to be baptized? I said, yes. Please, no, I will not baptize you. Please, I said, I'm kidding. Sure, I will baptize you. God bless you. Listen carefully. First year, we baptized only nine. For me, that was a disappointment. The church was ecstatic. We never had more than two baptisms in the last, whatever, two generations. Because only nine, because people need to be exposed two, three, four times to the gospel in order to make a decision. Therefore, you do it again next year, because next year you harvest the record from this year, like onion, it takes three years to harvest. So next year we had 16, because next year we baptize people who listen this year and next year. It takes them time to decide. They need to hear again and again. And after they hear it many times, they make decisions. Next year, we baptize 16. Next year, we baptize 23. Next year, we baptized around 38. Next year, we baptized 51. And after that, every year, we baptized an average of 50. The church went from 90 to over 300, 320, 340 in a few years. The church exploded. Moreover, by doing evangelism and the process every year, first year, we did mistakes. We didn't know. First year, we, 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 we didn't know how to do it. It is a learning process. I told the church, don't get discouraged because the more you do it, the better you are. It is a learning process. So next year, we did mistakes. Second year, we did much better. Third year, we are professionals. We knew the jobs, everybody. Fourth year, other conferences from the US. And then later, from around the world, started to call. How did you do it? We want to do the same. Any one of my members, even children, would tell you the stages and explain it. We taught the church and we repeated so many times until everybody could tell you how we did it. The church became professionals, not only the pastor, but all of them. We are all workers. Now, let me say, evangelism was the fourth stage. Nine to ten, one month. In the tenth month, we finished evangelism. The fifth last stage, it was follow-up. How we did it? In the North American division, the retention rate, it's about 47%. From every 100 people we baptize, about 47 stay in the church and 53 leave. When people get baptized, we celebrate and that's it. Baptism, birth, is not the end of the story. It's the beginning. When babies get born, you cannot just say it's the end of the story. You need to take care of the baby. The baby needs to grow. The baby needs to be nurtured. So we did follow up. So what we did, number one, in follow-up, a pastor class where we went again through all the doctrines. So many times we have baptisms and people don't even know what they believe in. We wanted to make sure that people are solid, people understand, people ask questions, they interact, we talk about it, we fully explain, pastor class. Number two, we had the raw host visit the people from his row that were baptized. They knew each other. 
So they did one visit a month. Plus we had the deacons visit them. Every deacon did one visit a month. We had 72 deacons in the church. Every deacon, one visit, that's 72 visits. That church told me that they never in history had so many visits. They told me this church cares. One visit a month and one phone call a week. People who got baptized, those people changed their whole life. They may lose jobs. They may lose friends, family. If they are alone, if they don't get support, they will drop. But if you visit them and pray with them and listen to them and you support them, they will stay if they have friends to help them through the change process. So we did visiting. We offer support and friendship and prayer. Pastor class, visiting. Number three, preaching on mission and give discovery seminar. Enough sermons that the new members started to understand that they need to work. Give discovery seminar so they know what gifts they have. So they don't try to do something that they don't know. Oh, try to do business when you have no clue. If your gift is teaching, you teach. If your gift is business, you, if your gift is health, it depends on the gift. Give discovery seminar. And then we had the new members involved in church activities. Everyone had to take a job. Everyone had to be part of a job. Grounds, greeters, choir. We didn't make them elders for sure, but they had to work. I told them in our church, there is no lazy Adventist. Either you work or you are not an Adventist. We discovered that people who worked stayed in the church. People who didn't work left. Also, the newcomers, they all had to give a Bible study. I told them, none of you could be in my church unless you care for the lost. Jesus told us to love people and to save the lost. You have friends, relatives that we don't know. You are responsible to give them the good news. So when the process started in January, all over again, stage one, stage two, stage three, the new baptized people, each one was part of the process. When the new baptized people give a Bible study, they themselves become stronger. Let me give you an example. We baptized 51. 50 were part of the Bible studies to give a Bible study. One lady refused. 50 stayed in the church. That lady left after three months. In our church, the retention rate was about 80%. In the American division was 47%. In our church, double. 80%, very good retention rate. People didn't leave the church. People are healthy, people are strong. In our church, let me explain, attendance grew to the point that we had no room in the church, no room in the parking. The church was packed. People had to come earlier to get a spot in the parking. We had to do two services. That's a wonderful problem to have. And it was an Anglo church. Spanish churches grow faster. African-American churches grow faster. Anglo churches, they are good people, but not so fast. It was an Anglo church. The church went from 90 to about 300. All ages represented. An average of 50 baptisms a year with about 80 to 90% retention rate. We did an NCD survey, Natural Church Development, NCD, Natural Church Development, that shows the health of the church. Before the process, our church was 30%. After the process, our church was 70%. In the top 15 top percent of the most healthiest churches in the world. Now, listen carefully. Our church was among top three fastest growing churches in the North American division. Also, our church was among top three tight paying in the union. I never preach money, but when people see that God is working, when people see that something is going on, when people see miracles and growth, people want to work and people want to give, people want to support when they see God at work. 
I didn't have to preach money. Tight went from 76% to 134%. Strong, tithing church. <clears throat> we had an average of 40 visitors a week from non-church people, other non-Adventist churches, other Adventist churches that heard that something is happening in our church, plus former Adventist members that left the church 20 years ago, 15 years ago, and they came back. We had an average of 40 visitors a week. We had an involvement of about 85%. Basically, 260 people worked. Before, only 11 people worked. Now, 260 people literally worked. I had a big problem. I didn't have time to work anymore because I got so many phone calls. Pastor, give me some work. I want to do something for this church. I want to be part of this. When people see that things go bad, they don't want it. But when people see God's moving, they all want to be part of it. Pastor, give me some work. I had to pray that God would give me wisdom because I didn't know anymore what to give them because there are too many people more than the work. That's a good problem to have. The church became active, healthy. There are no more conflicts. When people work, they have no time to fight. When people pray, they don't fight. There are no more division. The church became a friendly praying church. The church planted another church that right now has 70 members in the same city. And I could go on and on and on. We didn't spend much money because we use local people. Every seminar we gave, cooking class or whatever, they said, should we pay a professional? No, we do it. Oh, we don't know how to do it. Learn it. For instance, diabetes class. We asked one of the doctors, Pastor Batite, please pray and do it. First year, he did okay. Second year, he did research and he did much better. Third year, they started to call from other churches to call him to do diabetes seminars. The more they did, the better they became. And by asking the local members to do the seminars and to do the work, they were discipled and they grew and they became good. Our church, everybody was working, everybody was a professional eventually. They developed. We had activities during the week, every day. Any day of the week you would go, something happened, a youth class, a parents class. <clears throat> we went from two groups to 16 Sabbath school groups, all ages represented well. The church, we had four hours a week, local cable TV. We had our own radio towel, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, two languages. We had around 400,000 downloads a month on the internet with our sermons and seminars. 400,000 downloads a month, each month for five years until I left. The church, there were 70 some, 76, 77, 78 countries listening to our programs. A local church started to have a global impact. When people pray, things happen. It became one of the fastest growing churches in America one of the healthiest churches in America, a strong, tight-paying church, a working church. God changed the church. But that took five years. Commitment, prayer. You could not do only evangelism or only Bible studies. It's not enough to have the engine in order to have a car. It's not enough to have the transmission or alternator or the wheels. You need to have the whole car for the car to function. It's not enough to do only evangelism or only Bible studies or only community. You need to do all of the above. It takes work and prayer. But if you do the work, God will bless it tremendously. It's not going to happen in the first year. But as you repeat the process every year, it's going to start to grow. And the community will learn about you. And the church will become better. And eventually, the church will have a lot of results that even after the pastor moves, people will keep coming to that church. I want to give you a story and finish because our time is up long ago. <clears throat> we had so many stories. I could tell you for two days. Every sermon, before the sermon, for five minutes, not more, 
three, four, five, six minutes. We gave a story because Ellen White says should be less sermonizing and more sharing. She says that Jesus who know the human brain because he created us. He knows how we function. And she says, Jesus taught us stories and parables because stories go to the heart. Theology goes only to the mind and you need to win the heart in order to win the person. And so before every sermon, we gave a story. When people would hear the story, people would be moved. People would know that something is happening. God is working here and people had the passion to be part of it. And there was momentum and there was conviction that God is working in our church. People will say, we can sense God. And so I'm going to give you one of the stories. I was preaching. The lady, a lady, non-Adventist lady, came through the back door. She had a strange hair, red, pink, purple, green, whatever, all colors in her hair. She had many rings, many, many here in the nose, many in the lip, many in the ear, many above the eye, rings all over, many on her fingers. She had a chain, big chain by her pants. The pants were dropped way too low. She entered in the back and she came late, way late after the sermon started. And she didn't wait for the church to finish. When I finished the sermon, she didn't stay for the song or prayer, she left. When they do that, when they leave right away, it's because they don't want people to talk to them. They want to stay private. But we had a decision that nobody comes to our church without being prayed for. And so the saints were singing the closing song, so nobody prayed with her. So I left the saints singing and I run after her and she gets out of the church and she sees me coming and she goes to the car and she opens the door and I get and close the door and she says, I don't want to talk. I said, that's okay. I will talk. I don't believe in God. I didn't fight her. When you try to convince them, they argue back. Jesus didn't try to convince them. He would ask a question back to have the people respond to their own question to have the people themselves respond to their own need. She said, I don't believe in God. I don't want to talk. I didn't say, please believe in God. I said, you are drunk. She said, what? I said, you are drunk. No, I'm not drunk. Yes, you are. No, I am not drunk. I'm sober. Yes, you are drunk. No, I am not. Yes, you are. Why do you say that I am drunk? Because you said you don't believe in God. I don't believe in God and I'm not drunk. I said, then what are you doing here? Why would you come to a church if you don't believe in God? I mean, are you drunk? You are driving and you missed the, you got to a wrong address. You want to go to the movie and you got to the church because you are drunk. Ah, why would you come to a church if you don't believe in God? Ah, I do believe in God. I just don't believe in prayer. I didn't argue. I didn't say, please believe in prayer. I challenged her to answer. She said, I don't believe in prayer. I said, I know why. Why? Because you have blue eyes. She said, what? God hates people with blue eyes. If you had brown eyes like me, oh, God would love you and answer all your prayers. But because you have blue eyes, God cannot stand you and your prayers. She said, you are crazy, pastor. God answers every prayer regardless the color of the eye. I said, I got you. You said you don't believe in prayer. And now you say God answers every prayer. Please make up your mind. Ah, you corner me, pastor. I said, well, please decide. Do you believe in prayer or not? Well, pastor, theoretically I do. Practically I am discouraged. Tell me why. Well, pastor, I'm a drug addict. I've been in drugs for 16 years and I prayed and God didn't help me. And I went to rehab and I went to prison and I went to hospital and I'm still in drugs. Nobody helps me. I said, lady, do you want to get your drugs? Yes. Well, I'm going to tell you what to do. Oh, don't tell me because we tried everything. I said, listen, number one, how do you pray? Well, uh, I pray. No, tell me how. 
Well, uh, tell me the words. Well, I say, Lord, I'm a drug addict. I'm a drug addict. I depend on drugs. Please give me victory over drugs. Lord, I am in drugs. I am desperate. I don't know what to do. I am in drugs. Give me victory over drugs. I said, lady, you dwell more in drugs instead of dwelling on Christ. If you keep your mind on drugs, you'll stay in drugs. I said, after you confess your sin, Lord, I am a drug addict. When you confess, the Bible promise that you will be forgiven. If we confess, God is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. When you confess, you are forgiven. You are clean. When you confess, Jesus takes your sin upon himself and gives you his righteousness. You are clean. You are no longer a drug addict. You are forgiven. Your sin is no, there, no longer there. It's gone. You are as white as snow. You are no longer in drugs. So don't dwell on drugs. After you confess, you say, Lord, I praise you for giving me victory. Don't pray, lady, doubt and drugs. Pray faith and promises. Don't focus on your sins. Don't focus on the problems. Focus on God. Don't keep your eyes on drugs. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Say, Lord, thank you for giving me victory. I don't know how. I don't deserve it. I don't understand. I cannot do it. But I believe in you. Thank you. And then say, Lord, I praise you for your promises. I praise you for your power to deliver. I praise you for your grace. I said, lady, dwell on Jesus. Because the more you see Jesus, the less you think about drugs. Number two. Number one, pray Jesus. Don't pray problem. Number two, spend time with Jesus. The more time you spend in prayer and study of the word, the more he will transform you, the less power Satan has about, upon you. Every day. Because change doesn't happen in a second. Very rarely people change in a second. Growth happens slow. So you need to consistently every day spend time in prayer and study. And God is going to grow you more and more. Three years later, you will not be the same. And number three, I want you to give a Bible study. Me? Yes. Why? What's the connection with drugs? God doesn't need you. God doesn't need me. If we don't talk, the stones will talk. But God called you to service because as you save others, as you serve others, you grow. The more you teach others, the more you grow. The more you save others, the more you grow. The more you become like Christ, the more you grow in your faith, the stronger you are. God called you because by saving others, you become stronger and stronger. You become more and more like Jesus. You tell me, pastor, that if I pray focusing on Jesus, and if I spend every day time in prayer and study, and if I give a Bible study to save others, that will give me victory? Yes. Pastor, but I don't know how to teach a Bible study. Oh, that's easy. You don't teach. And I told her, first time you visit, second time you pray with them, third time you enter the house, but you don't teach. You let them watch it. And you just are there to build friendship and to pray for them. You let the Holy Spirit convince. So you don't have to teach. Oh, I can do that. But pastor, if, I, if God doesn't give me victory over drugs, I will never come back to your church. I said, okay, deal. I gave her the Bible study and the address, and she left. It was 12.15, 12.20, Sabbath afternoon. 15 minutes later, she called me. I hate you. I hate your church. I'll never come back. I said, what happened? Well, it's an apartment building. And there is, the door is locked. And there is a, 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 a board with many buttons. And you have to ring the bell. And somebody from inside has to open the door. And nobody is home. God doesn't consider me worth it to give a Bible study. Say, lady, did you pray that God would open the door so you could give a Bible study? Oh, I didn't think about it. Pray that God would open the door and give you an opportunity to give a Bible study. Okay. One minute later, she called me back. I prayed and God didn't answer my prayer. I said, lady, how long did you pray? Well, a quick prayer. Lady, you want a big miracle with a small prayer? If you want big answer, you need to pray big prayer. Well, pastor, how long do you want me to pray? Five minutes? I said, until the door opens. Ten minutes? Until the door opens. Half an hour, pastor? 
I said, you don't understand. Pray as long as it takes until the door opens. Well, what if the door doesn't open, pastor? Well, if the door doesn't open, you keep praying. How long? Until the evening comes and then during the night, until the morning, you don't go to work, you don't go home, you don't sleep, you don't eat, you pray and you pray and you pray one month, one year, until you are old, retired, until you die in the car praying. And you say, Lord, you can kill me. I'm not gonna move unless you give me an opportunity to save a person. Oh, pastor, I cannot be so serious to pray, so committed to prayer, to pray so long. I've never prayed so long in my life. Well, maybe that's an, the reason you don't get an answer. Do you want to get victory over drugs? Yes, then pray serious. Oh, pastor, I said, pray. And I commit myself to pray with you. As long as you pray, I will not go home. I will not sleep. I will not eat. As long as you pray in your car, I will pray in my office. When you call me that God opened the door and you gave a Bible study, then I stop praying. Would you do that for me, pastor? Yes. It was about 12.20 afternoon. She called me back at 5.30. I was so hungry. She was crying. Pastor, pastor, you will not believe what happened. Tell me quick because I am hungry. Don't give me any introduction. Just tell me the story. Pastor, I prayed the nicest prayer my mom taught me when I was a kid. And God didn't answer. And then I got frustrated. And I opened my eyes. And I started to be honest with the Lord. And I said, Lord, I know I am a sinner. I know I don't deserve it. But please let me give a Bible study. Because the pastor said that if I help others, if I teach others, if I save others, I myself would grow. Please, Lord, open the door. I know I don't deserve it. And pastor, when I started to open my heart, guess what happened? I said, lady, prayer is not a nice poetry, nice words. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. And pastor, when I was opening my heart, you know what happened? The door of the apartment building opened and the big guy, African-American, tall, big guy, came to the door with the garbage to go to the trash container. So I stopped praying and I ran to him and I said, can you let me inside? He says, why don't you ring the bell? I did, but nobody is home. Then why would I let you inside? Well, I have to deliver a Bible study and I want to put it under the door. He says, I'm not gonna let you inside. Please, I am upset with you. Why would you be upset with me? You don't even know me. Because I asked for a Bible study and nobody came. Oh, that's easy. Then I can give you this Bible study <clears throat> and come again next week when they are home to give them a Bible study. He said, okay, come inside. No, no, no. The pastor said that first time I just deliver. I don't go inside. Lady, I asked for a Bible study and you offered to give a Bible study. I've never had a Bible in my life. I don't know how to study. Come inside and teach me how to study. Pastor, I went inside. He said, sit down. I sat down. You know what he did, Pastor? He got up and he left. And I was alone in his apartment. Five minutes, 10 minutes. I didn't know, should I wait or go? He came back with 11 other guys, all big, leather jacket, ponytail, motorcycle gang. I was so afraid, I started to pray for my safety. And he said to them, folks, <clears throat> We have been in drugs all our life. Last week we talked and we said, drugs are going to kill us. So after that, I prayed first time in my life. And I said, if there is a God, and if you can hear me, please send an angel to teach us how to get rid of drugs. Folks, God answered my prayer and sent an angel. Sit down and listen to her. And she said, pastor, I started to cry. And I said, I am a drug addict just like you. But the pastor said that if in prayer I focus on Jesus, not on my sins, not on myself, and if I spend every day time with Jesus in prayer and study, and if I save somebody, if I teach somebody, if I give a Bible study, the more I teach others, the stronger I become, the more I serve, the more I grow. When I save others, I will be saved. 
then God will give me victory and salvation. So if you want victory over drugs, this is how you pray. And this she was teaching them. And, and, and this is how you study every day. And you should give a Bible study. You should work with somebody. You should save somebody. But lady, we don't have Bible studies. Oh, the pastor has plenty. But we don't know how to. Oh, it's easy. First time you deliver. Second time you pray for them. Third time you enter the house, but you don't have to teach. You just stay there and you watch the DVD together with them. Oh, that's easy. Let's watch it. Let's watch it. And pastor, we all watch the DVD. After half an hour, those men started to cry. They said, please come again next Sunday. We have never heard anything so good. Pastor, this is the best day of my life. It's the first time in my life when I have joy and peace. And pastor, let me tell you the good news. It's 5.30. I did drugs at 9.30 a.m. I usually did, do drugs every two hours. It's 5.30. And I'm, I don't feel the need. And I'm not shaking. And I don't even think about drugs. I'm so happy. I said, lady, when you stay in God's presence, Satan has no access to you. Only when you separate from God, he attacks you. Number one. Number two, when you work with others, Satan has no power over you. Keep praying and keep serving. That lady came next week to church. Her hair was normal color. No more rings. I didn't tell her to do that. She did it alone. But that lady kept coming. She's still coming. And she's still working with people. I told her, next Sabbath, I want you to share the story with the church. Oh, no, me before the church, no. I said, don't worry. I don't let you talk. You know why? Because sometimes people talk so long, they take 40 minutes. It's always an interview. I ask questions and you just answer. This way, you know, I could control the timing. So I said, I will ask the question. And you say, yes, no, easy. Next Sabbath, she shared the story together with me with the church. And then I said, how many of you want to give a Bible study? Everybody, me, me. You know, every Sabbath we had stories. The church could sense God's presence. The church could sense that God is there and God works. There was momentum. There was no conflicts. There was joy. There was peace. There was fulfillment. There was a sense of growth, there was a sense that something is happening. I don't even know how to explain it. It, it was a, a, a sense of joy. <clears throat> anyway, a sense of success, a feeling of, of the, the hearts were rejoicing, a feeling that God is real and working. Healthy church. Anyway. My time is way up. I passed half an hour. I have other things, other places to preach. We need to have just five minutes questions and answers. And we need to finish. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Okay, do we have any questions? You may ask your question in the chat um, in French. And we'll have our translator just translate it as well or you can do it live you can do it live as well so if you have a question ask it in french and the translator will translate it that may go faster than than typing okay so do we have any questions okay so this is the opportunity for questions i think you can hear me and you can ask a question on any topic that was covered from Friday night, uh, Sabbath afternoon, as well as uh, tonight's topic, a very powerful topic uh, and powerful experience as well. So do we have any questions? So Pastor, maybe I should start off asking a question just to get us going. Yes. Um, what, what you have shared with us is powerful and it possibly can be overwhelming to uh, some folk that may have listened to say, wow, uh, what, what you have shared is something so powerful. Our church is so way back. Um, we have so many problems. We have so many challenges. Where do we start? How are we going to get to that point? Uh, you shared it with us step by step, but how would you respond to somebody that may be feeling a little bit 
overwhelmed uh, so that they can get a sense that, you know, this is something we can do. God can help us with, with this. So that's a good question. It's very real. I want to mention, number one, this doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. It takes years. Therefore, I would not be concerned with how much work, how can we do it, but rather take one day at a time, take one step, prayer. Because as people pass step number one, they will be prepared for step number two. It's a growth process. Children don't grow from here to here. They grow a little and a little. So that's how it is possible. Number two, by praying and growing, they become more flexible and more willing and more prepared. Number three, by doing, they learn to do better and better. So basically take one step at a time and do it in a prayerful manner. Because when people pray, God can work and provide resources and blessings and courage and support. And they are more flexible. They have more faith. Basically prayer and in time. Okay, so somebody may say, uh, but pastor, uh, you don't understand. Our church is so busy. There are so many programs. Where do I find the time? I, I've got so many things to do at work. I work from six in the morning to six at night. I, you know, there's so many programs at church. I am one of the, uh, I'm a personal ministries lead. I'm a Sabbath school director. I'm the elder. I've got to run the programs. The conference was giving me more pro, giving us more programs. We're getting more programs in events coming from the union. Uh, we've got to uh, do all these events. Where Understood. are we going to find the time to prioritize? Three points. Number one, I was not trying to manipulate the church, but I didn't tell the church, we are going to do this and that and that and that. No. I just preached on prayer. When the church started to pray, I preached on mission. Basically, it was slow. Point number one. Point number two, very important. Point number two. People, when you ask them to do this and that and that, they are overwhelmed. But when people pray and God impresses them to do something, in, when God puts it in their heart, they take it as priority. But point number three, I never allowed anybody to have more than two jobs, one important and one minor. Because in some churches, one person does 10 jobs and the other one does nothing. And I would rather have people do less and quality and not be tired than do a lot and then give up. I never allowed anybody to take two jobs. I said more people and less jobs for everyone. But also there is more than that. We had people that in the beginning would not have been willing to do one more thing. But after we preached on prayer and mission for a long time and the Holy Spirit convinced them, it took months for them to be convinced that we need to reach the community. After we preached for a long time, People are willing to sacrifice. And when I didn't allow them to take 10 jobs, but only two jobs per person, when people finally were willing to commit and to surrender and to sacrifice, and each one to do maybe one or two jobs, because they were praying, they discovered, and they told me that. For instance, I had a man, Peter, a doctor, came to me and said, Pastor, I thought I would lose my job because I spent so much with evangelism at the church. But he said, this month during evangelism, when I was every day at the church, God blessed me in my job at the hospital more than in my whole life before. People with business said, this month when we spent time at the church, our money didn't go down. We made just the same in business. People, I had them share the stories and people experience God's blessing. When they sacrifice, you cannot outgive God. And because of preaching and people being willing to sacrifice and people not being allowed to take too many jobs and because of the stories shared and people knowing that God blessed the church, there was a feeling that even if you sacrifice, God is faithful to bless you back in your family, in your business, and God can bless you in one hour more than you do in one day of work. And so we sensed God's presence. There was all of the above coming together that gave them confidence and joy in sacrificing. All right, thank you very much, Pastor. Uh, is there anyone else? Now, I want to mention something. 
We do want to have plans. We don't want to be chaotic. We want to be organized, but should not be our human plan. We need to surrender our plans to yeah. God because he may say, do this, don't do that. Don't do it now because God knows the community. God knows what works, okay? If we had time, I would give you an example from a poor, poor, small, 30 people church, all elderly, all, not one young, not one uh, middle age, all old, no programs, no money in a small village, 7,000 people village. And that church also grew. I could give you another example and another example, but we don't have time to show you that prayer works, but not one week, commitment to prayer. Okay, other questions or we finish? I think we, we haven't received any more questions, uh, Pastor Goya. Um, so I think we're done for today. We thank you for taking the time to share with us, for inspiring us, challenging us. And the sermons and the messages have been very practical. And um, I think when we say it's challenging, uh, it hasn't just been an, a good sermon or a good message. Une bonne présentation, mais surtout parce que cela nous pousse à l'action. To pray and say, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? Lord, what is it that you are directing me uh, to accomplish in your church? Just to start praying. If that is the only commitment that each and every one will make here today. Donc, si nous prenons un engagement aujourd'hui, simplement de prier. I am going to start by praying until you show me on prend cet engagement seigneur je veux commencer à prier à partir d'aujourd'hui jusqu'à ce que tu me montres ce que tu attends de moi ce que tu veux que je fasse dans ton église et ce que je, tu veux que je fasse pour la mission commitment that you want to make a very practical commitment so i'm going to uh, raise mine as well just raise your digital hand where you are. We can't see you. Your video is not on. But it would all be in vain if we did not take the next step. It would all be in vain unless we took specific actions. Donc, and perhaps the. Cette, cette, ce weekend aura été en vain si nous ne prenons pas uh, une décision. I'm si going nous nous impliquons pas. Uh, first of all, for myself and how you want to use me. And then you begin praying for your leaders, for those of you who are leaders, uh, for, for pastors. Nous pas seulement prendre l'engagement de prier pour, pour nous, mais prier aussi pour les leaders de l'église, pour nos pasteurs, pour, pour l'église. Very specific. And then nos we begin to pray for someone. And then they begin to pray. Prier de manière spécifique et prier avec quelqu'un. And this will, be, this will begin to create the momentum because then everything will be Holy Spirit led. Then God will begin to move. God will show you the way. What will happen in one church will be very different in another church. We must allow God to lead us, God to guide us. When you get discouraged, voilà, ce que Dieu pourrait faire pour une église sera complètement différent dans une autre église, mais parce que nous avons prié, l'Esprit Saint va nous conduire. Remember one thing. Keep praying and God will show you the nous way. Rappeler, que uh, because Dieu, nous Jesus nous never fails. So let's not give nous up. Nous la voix. Alors, allons ne pas ab abandonner, allons faire cet engagement, ça doit être pratique. Uh, the church board, not ultimately to the conference, not ultimately uh, to any institution, but you are accountable to God. Nous ne sommes pas redevables envers les institutions, le comité d'église, l'église, le diocèse, mais nous sommes res responsables devant Dieu parce que c'est devant lui que nous prenons cet engagement. Praying like you've never prayed before. That's so, the commitment. Allons prendre l'engagement de prier comme nous n'avons jamais prié auparavant. The commitment that we as pastors will make and those of us who are conference leaders and the commitment that I am making personally as well. So may God bless you as we put Le this. Seigneur in puisse nous bénir. Two words. Uh, first, again, I want to remind even in the most discouraging situation. Uh, Je vous rappeler que même dans les situations les plus décourageantes, we don't have a way. God has a way. 
and there is nothing to lose by prayer. As you said, when people pray, it will bring an, a spiritual environment, a sense of God's presence that would prepare the way and would provide. And God has his ways. So there is not, nothing to lose the, on the other side actually will grow when we pray. Number one. But number two, it takes time. It takes, be consistent. Keep doing it, not for a week only. And I wanted again to thank you for inviting me and for organizing this. And uh, again, what we say here is general principles. You may have to adjust it according to God's leading, according to your situation. But uh, if you need help, if you need resources that we could help with, uh, let me know. I'll be glad to do my best. Thank you. And may God richly bless you. Let me, I mean, we should probably have a prayer before we close. Either me, I could pray for you or... You pray for us. Okay, let's pray. You pray for us. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the undeserved privilege to serve. We are not able, Lord. We don't have the power, the wisdom, the means. But you, Lord, there is nothing impossible for you. We ask for your help. And now specifically for the precious people from this conference and from Mauritius. Lord, you know them. You know their struggles. You know their needs. You know their hearts. Please bless them with your presence. Bless them with your Holy Spirit. Lead them. Help them. And Father, may they sense your help and your presence. And may the results be greater than we can even ask or imagine. Because you are a wonderful God, a God of the impossible. Please bless the pastors and their families. Please bless the elders and the churches, the deacons, the directors of departments. And Father, please bless the conference, the leadership. They have great responsibility. Bless them and lead them and help them. Uh, Father, complete my prayer. We pray in humbleness, only in Jesus' name, only in his merits. We know that you love us and we trust in you and we thank you and we praise you. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Pastor Goya. We wish you well and may God continue to use you and bless you. And we hope that you will be uh, willing to assist us when we call on you. It might be for the interim, another Zoom meeting. Um, uh, we'll communicate uh, as we have questions, as we have needs, and we hope that uh, you will find the time to help our little conference here. Thank you once again. Lord bless you. And to all of you, thank you very much. The Lord bless you. We look forward to seeing you soon. Uh, God bless and goodbye. Blessings.